Fascism and socialism are blending themselves into a new internationalism being advanced by the Council on Foreign Relations. The CFR is an organization that was founded in 1921 by some of the nation's most influential lawyers and bankers. It describes itself as an independent, nonpartisan membership organization, think tank, and publisher dedicated to helping its members better understand the world and the foreign policy choices facing the United States and other countries. Among its more than 4,000 members are some of the most powerful and influential people in America and the world. Put simply, their goal is to secretly devise a policy to advance their global agenda, then use their members' power and prestige to influence American foreign policy to those ends. I recall that in the 1970s, the CFR and its globalist agenda had fallen into such disfavor in the United States that it had to form a new front group to continue its work. Such was the Trilateral Commission, which was created for that purpose. Jimmy Carter and the man who later became National Security Advisor, Big New Brzezinski, were instrumental in founding the Trilateral Commission. As a matter of fact, after uh, Mr. Carter became president, his cabinet became known as the Trilateral Cabinet. But now we can see the impact of the liberal re-education program that were deliberately introduced into our entire school systems in the 1960s. Most Americans under the age of 50 have been thoroughly indoctrinated with one-worldism thinking. Organizations like the CFR can now openly push for the abandonment of our constitutional safeguards. They can promote the idea of surrendering our national sovereignty to an elitist group of leaders that will protect us from the catastrophic dangers lurking in the world. The CFR is now advancing a new program called the International Institutions and Global Governance Program, or the IIGG. And this is to assess existing regional and global governance mechanisms. Its goal is to identify several global issues that require a system of world governance. Thus far, among the dangers the IIGG has identified are global warming. Remember that one? Overpopulation, terrorism, and the economic meltdown. No surprise there. Former member Rear Admiral Chester Ward said of the Council on Foreign Relations, the most powerful clique in these elitist groups have one objective in common. They want to bring about the surrender of the sovereignty and the national independence of the United States. A second clique of international members in the CFR comprise the Wall Street international bankers and their key agents. Primarily, they want the world banking monopoly from whatever power to end up in the control of global government. The program calls for reconceptualization of national sovereignty. It cites the EU's pooling of sovereignty as a model. But the CFR, which was founded and is still based in America, sees the United States as the major stumbling block. It recognizes that historically, the U.S. has been resistant to the ideals of global governance. Among the most important factors determining the future of global governance will be the attitude of the United States. In a direct attack against the U.S. Constitution, it continues, Few countries have been as sensitive as the United States to restrictions on their freedom of action or as jealous in guarding their sovereign prerogatives. The program then states that the separation of powers, as stated in the Constitution, along with the U.S. Congress, stand in the way of the United States assuming new international obligations. The Chinese newspaper Xinhua covered the story. It reports that the director of the IIGG program is hoping that the Obama administration will seek to turn the page on what many perceive to be cowboy unilateralism of the Bush years by embracing multilateral cooperation 
rekindling U.S. alliances and partnerships, and engaging in sustained diplomacy within the U.N. framework. The IIGG project itself stated in May of 2008 that regardless of whether the administration that takes office in January 2009 is Democratic or Republican, the thrust of U.S. foreign policy is likely to be multilateral to a significant degree. Among Washington insiders, President Obama's administration is being openly called, guess what? the CFR administration. I'll be back after this break. Back in 1950, CFR member James Warburg testified before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. During his testimony, he stated bluntly, we shall have world government whether or not you like it by conquest or consent. Warburg was in a position to know his father, Paul Warburg, was responsible for creating the most important tool of global government ever devised, the Federal Reserve. Paul Warburg was so highly respected as a financier that he was tapped by Senator Nelson Aldrich to author a study on discounting commercial bills. Aldrich, John D. Rockefeller Jr.'s father-in-law, was the chairman of the Senate Finance Committee. His committee was charged with developing a central banking scheme for the United States, ostensibly to forestall the financial panics that regularly plagued the U.S. economy at the turn of the century. The United States at that time suffered from periodic liquidity crises engineered largely by the financial community. The bankers argued that it was due to the rigid nature of the currency supply. In those days, in order to make a loan, the banks were actually required to have the cash money on deposit. The bankers argued that adequate money supplies could not be funneled in time to the industries that needed it most. Sounds sensible when you hear the bankers argue it, but the argument quickly loses weight when you realize its implications. Held up against the light of true intentions, here's what it means. We want to be able to charge you interest for loans made with money we don't have. So we want you to lend, us, lend it to us for free first. To ensure that the population got the message, a series of currency shortages were engineered by those who wanted this lucrative central banking scheme. Since the entire banking system was not yet under a central authority, the panics were generally localized in predetermined geographic locations across the states. A large bank or group of cooperating banks would restrict credit to farmers and businesses. As a result, industries were often unable to finance inventories or farmers get their crops to market. Many went under. Such failures had a ripple effect. Grain rotting in the fields meant a shortage of livestock feed. Higher feed prices forced many livestock producers into bankruptcy. Fewer livestock producers drove the price of meat through the roof. Business failures often weakened other related industries. The creation of the Federal Reserve was a masterpiece of management by engineered crisis. The pressure on Wall Street caused markets to plunge, forcing smaller, weaker banks to fail.